This video is brought to you by the Naval Institute Press and Battleship Bismarck, a design and operational history. See the link in the description for details. So I'm Rick Russell uh, with Bering Strait Media and uh, former press director of the Naval Institute. And today we're here with um, uh, William H. Garski Jr. And um, it's an honor, and it's an honor, Bill, uh, to be here with you. And by way of introduction, uh, I want to mention uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, Bill graduated from the University of Michigan's uh, prestigious program in naval architecture and marine engineering. He also has a master's degree from the Delphi University in applied mathematics. He studied at MIT. As we were just talking about, he also taught uh, nautical, uh, uh, naval architecture and marine engineering at Kings Point at the Merchant Marine Academy. So it's it's great, uh, I, Bill. I wanted to I wanted to talk about how you got into history because we almost lost it to geology. So maybe we could back up a little bit. And you were in geology, but then you switched to naval architecture. So maybe we could pick it up there, and you could tell us about how you ended up at Michigan, and then eventually at Gibbs and Cox. Yes, very interesting uh, progression of, of in my career. I started out in geology. I was going to go to the Colorado School of Mines. When I got there in 1950, uh, 1957, I realized that after reading a book on the train from uh, Chicago to, to Denver, that uh, I had wondered if there was such a thing as naval architecture, because I read the book uh, Battle was on the North Atlantic by John Woodward, a little pocket-sized book. But uh, it was a 45, 145 pages, and I read it in two hours. And after that, I said to myself, I wonder, uh, am I making the right decision on geology? The next day, I had a, when I arrived on campus at the Colorado School of Mines, uh, I had, a, had an interview with the head of the Department of Geology. And he went over the course and said, I have already taken it. He said, well, Mr. Gorski, you have to, you have to do the class on crystallography and mineralogy over again. And structural geology doesn't fit into our program as well. So I went back to Dean Burdick, and uh, who had uh, arranged for me to, to go back to New York previously from a previous trip uh, to Colorado School of Mines. And I asked him the question, is there such a thing as naval architecture? And Dean Burdick said, yes, there is. I said, well, that's what I want to be. And that's a real, I had a marine background. I already had a, a uh, uncle, uh, my uncle Jack, who was really, uh, had a lot of influence on me. Uh, he used to work at the New York Naval Shipyard in New York. And he, um, we talk about all the ships that he worked on with me. He uh, even bought me a, a schooner once for a Christmas gift. And But he also took me to see the launch of the Kearsage CV-33 and the Ariscany CV-60, uh, rather, 50, uh, or 36. And uh, uh, when I, when there was the third fleet came to New York in 1945. I went aboard the Midway and uh, the uh, Helena, the cruiser. And but on the previous Saturday, he took me to see the Missouri, the battleship Missouri. And uh, there was a big long line of people waiting to get in. But Uncle Jack had a, a way of. He had his badge from the New York Naval Shipyard. He showed it to the policeman and he said, I have a job to do on the ship. So, yeah. and he said, you're gonna take the young man with you? He said, yes. Uh, so I got to see the plaque where the surrender took place. Uh, battleship started to interest me a little bit. I saw an article in Life Magazine about the, uh, rec the uh, damage done to the battleship turbots. And I started, when I came back to New York after the interview with uh, Dean Burdick, I, I went to the 
library at Brooklyn College where I was told to take these certain courses which I had missed. And that would qualify me better for the Colorado School of Mines. But I didn't like being uh, in the Army Engineers because at, at Colorado School of Mines, they had the Army R ROTC. And I didn't want to be in the Army, but I would like to have been in the CB, in the CBs. And so I read every book on, on ships I could get. It's like books like um, the Titanic, I do remember, for example. The Laws of Lusitania, the Bismarck, and a few other ships that I can't, I can't remember. But then in 1956, while uh, we're getting ready to go back to Colorado School of Mines, the loss of the Andrea Doria happened. And uh, the fellow neighbor next door and I wanted to figure out a way how to make light boats accessible, even the ship was sinking. I, you know, I'll have a list. So I volunteered to help him, but I didn't have the qualifications at that time to, to really do the research. So, but I uh, get ready to leave the car. Uh, I wasn't to. Uh, I got ready to leave the Colorado, uh, Colorado School of Mines. And so, but now, going back, we get back to Dean Burdick. And he recommended three schools to me that were MIT, uh, University of Michigan, and Webb Institute in New York. Uh, all of these schools would be a, all play very important in my career in the future. Uh, so I decided, well, I couldn't afford, my father couldn't afford, and mother couldn't afford uh, MIT, but maybe Michigan. And of course, uh, I was accepted there, and I started school there in 1957. And the first person I met was my professor, Professor uh, <clears throat> Harry Benford. And Harry Benford would have a very important point in my later career. Also, the other, an older professor, Professor Henry Carter Adams III, was my first uh, took my first course with him at the University of Michigan. And when I, he was a pretty stern fellow, but he had been the chief naval architect for Gibbs and Cox before going through the University of Michigan. Um, he scared the heck out of me because in the first course, he said, first, uh, first session, he said, we get uh, homework, maybe, an hour or so, uh, th he said, but for each week of the semester, you'll be given a problem to solve. Uh, I give an exam, midterm, uh, you'll all fail it because you probably don't know enough about naval architecture. And then he said, the final exam will count 90% uh, of your grade, and my heart dropped. <laughs> Hi. So, but I got through the, the course, and then I graduated from there in 1958 with a pretty good, uh, great one. And, uh, but I still think today that was the wisest decision I ever made in my life because I loved naval architecture and marine engineering. And I went to work after graduation at Gibson Cox. And uh, there I met uh, William Francis Gibbs. And what year was that, Bill? Uh, 1960. 60. Uh, I was also decide, decided I'd write a book on battleships because when I went to left for Michigan, my parents gave me this book called The British Battleships by Dr. Oscar Parks. Uh -huh. This book had a very important decision on what I was going to do. I read his book, not all of it, but page to page, but it was cover to cover. But I did look at the section on ships, recent ships, which was not which was incomplete, and I decided maybe I should write the full history of those ships uh, and uh, in a book. So that sort of graduated a little bit further. I also was a teacher in the German battleship Bismarck. So I decided when I graduated from Michigan that I would write a book on 
battleships. And that brought me to start corresponding with German uh, sources. But in the meantime, I met Robert Doolin. When I mentioned, um, excuse me, when I mentioned Robert Doolin, we became lifelong friends. But that wasn't so easy because he had been doing a book on the Japanese battleship Yamato and Musashi, which was taken by the Naval Institute Press as a nomograph, later, later to be uh, published. Uh, Bob and I met in April 1961, finally face to face. We have been corresponding, but our correspondence was uh, helped by a contact in Japan, Zuzuo Fukui. And both of us have been writing, and Fukui said to us in both letters to both Bob and I, you guys should be getting together and writing a book together. And we decided to do that on, in April, on April 22nd, 1961. Um, I was given the task of doing the, the research and writing on the Germans, the uh, uh, British, French, and uh, we had neither. And uh, Bob was going to do the one on uh, the uh, Japanese, the uh, Italian, and the Russians. Along the way, we finally realized there was another country that got involved in a capital construction, and that was the Dutch. The, the Dutch Navy had a long history of, uh, in the marine field, not because they had been, uh, also have had a, uh, the Dutch East, which was uh, the fourth largest uh, oil producer in 1940. And so they, they needed ships to protect their investment, particularly because of Japanese aggression in the Far East at that time, 1940. So then Bob and I did all the things. I went to uh, Europe, first trip to Europe in 1962. And what I decided to do was I take a trip on the uh, return on the SS France the main boards of the France. Well, uh, money at that time, not, not being married, uh, was easy for me to make the decision to go first class uh, because I wanted to see the whole ship, not just the tourist part. So I left for uh, in January of 1962 to go to Europe with a, a reservation and paid reservation for the SS France on the return voyage to New York. And also I flew off from New York to Paris. Of course, that's interesting. When I got to Paris, I realized one thing, I don't speak French. <laughs> but I had visited the French Admiralty and uh, and uh, I had a, a day-long interview with, with a, a commander uh, uh, in the French Navy who uh, gave me a, a lot of information on the battleship Richelieu. Um, I also realized at the time that he told me that we have also, the, it was a Dunkirk and Strasbourg, uh, two battle cruisers, although the French call them battleships. Uh, anyhow, Bob in the meantime started the research on the you know, U.S., Japanese, and Italian, although, and Russian. Although the Italian, I sort of helped them in the beginning because I had done some research on the Italian. So, but I turned over the, the job to him. Meantime, I concentrated on the Germans, the Japanese, the Germans, and the British, and the French which was a job in itself because of the great big man of a long history in that capital ship construction. Uh, so Bill, let me ask, so at this point, you, you and Bob are working together, you're gonna to do the world's battleships, but it's not, you haven't made any decisions about volumes or, or that kind, you're no. just, you're deep into the research, you're traveling, okay. So it's just one big piece of work. 
put together a, a, a manuscript by 1964, but there was a complication. Uh, that, that time, Bob was married to Joan uh, McWilliams, and he uh, he married Joan in 1962. And in the meantime, I still was looking for a wife, <laughs> in a sense. But in 1963, I finally found my wife, uh, Loretta Vince. And these two women had a lot of uh, a part in how we wrote books, particularly uh, my, my wife, uh, Loretta. She uh, read my first uh, cut at the Montana class battleship for the U.S. Navy. I told Bob that I was very interested in that because I was interested in the design progression and the feasibility studies that went on to, to formulate that ship design. However, when she read it, the, the manuscript, she went to her father and said, I don't want to lose a bill, but this work, one of the ladies work, we work. <laughs> and I said, well, I took the job and went back home and I wrote the chapter. Okay. But of course, I turned that over to Bob Dillon, who went over to the Bureau of Ships and finalized, the design, you know, finalized our research on that ship and others in the U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. Bob also I had uh, done by meeting Bob. I had also done research on the American battleships by uh, an interview with uh, George Tankers of the Bureau of Ships, who had been a Michigan graduate and was very happy to help me with the, the research and on writing a book. And I went and I spent a, a couple of days at the Bureau of Ships going over the the. Uh, uh, design histories. Uh, Bob also brought, in the meantime, uh, the plans of the Montana, which was very interesting because it was for sale. And when they, the mirror ships personnel realized what we had, they, uh, they said that it should be classified. <laughs> but Bob showed them the, the bill of lading that he had for Jesus purchasing the plans. And so that was kind of foolhardy for them to pursue and keep you know, those yeah. secret. So all together now, I was married now, and uh, we became time to put together the book together. Finally, he had all our research. So we, uh, got, we uh, had all the chapters together. Uh, in one volume, never realizing the uh, the amount of material is still out of it because of the gaps, no question about it. But of course, as I go back to this book that I got as a gift from my parents when I went to Michigan, I realized that uh, there's three classes of battleships in the run in the British Navy that needed research, and uh, Bob had made contact with a uh, uh, person in the UK named Dr. Ian Buxton. And Dr. Buxton uh, was very interested in what I was doing when I told him that I had already been to the uh, Ministry of Defense in, in uh, Bath, England. And I was the first uh, civilian who was allowed to go into the, uh, into the archives and a building of the Ministry of Defense there, probably because I was in, uh, I worked for Gibson Cox, which made a big difference. Now, I continue working at MIT at um, Gibson Cox, which is interesting because, as I said, I took the main voice of the ESS France. When William Francis Gibbs found out about it, he had me right into his office wanted to see everything, and he wanted to make sure that when I went on to France that I had a necessary material that I, and, and gadgets that I could give him some information. So I think it sounds like a spy <laughs> for Gibson Cox, because they, well, Gibson Cox is famous for designing and building the USS United States. Right. Um, no, I was very impressed with them, the, the France. And uh, of course, 
the one thing that he uh, chided me about was the stack design. I spent uh, some time on my own and at the office researching stack design. So I had some idea of what was needed in stack design. And I found out that, uh, uh, that the stack design of the United States originally was not exactly the best design because it had problems with uh, the uh, smoke from the funnels getting on the decks and on our people, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the Grace Line ships that gives design the Santa Rosa and the Santa Paula. But I won't go into details of what happened there. The poor people, as soon as we got really doused with a, when they blew this, the, uh, the boilers, the plants of boilers. However, now, with uh, having met William Francis Gibbs, he also was interested in my, what I was doing on battleships. And what we're going to do now, I, so I talked to Bob, and Bob and I looked at, decided, well, we might as well put together what we have, and we'll look for a publisher. That is interesting. Where do we go? Uh, well, Bob's monograph with the uh, model and massage, he was uh, already uh, interested by the Naval Institute. And so we started with them. And to our surprise, they decided they would publish the book. The book. But in our meeting with Roger Taylor, who was then the executive director, and his uh, assistant, I forget his name, recommended that we do it in three of other in, uh, volumes, or in the chapters, but in the same volume. But only, the only problem was we needed an illustrator. We, uh, we found Robert Summerall. And Robert Summerall was to do the illustration for all the books, all the, all the, uh, all the chapters. And he agreed to do the job. However, as time worked on, uh, and, he, and his involvement, that didn't work out too, too, too well. And we had to replace him with Tom Webb in, uh, uh, later on, around 1965, 66. Now we have a, how to propose the book, because Mr. Summerall could not finish uh, the Japanese, the German, the Italian, and the other designs that we wanted to work on, uh, chapters that we wanted to work on. Uh, so I'm talking with Robert Brewer in uh, 1966. It was decided that we divide the books up into three volumes. Uh, one on the United States, which Summerall already had done the drawings for the uh, ships in that, in that book. And then the uh, Axis and Battleships and the Allied Battleships, so three volumes. Well, now the volume two was to be the Allied Battleships in World War II, covering the British, the French, the, the Dutch, and the, uh, uh, and, and for the French. And the, the Russians. And, and, and the Russian. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, we have the, the Russian. And Bob had a real problem with the Russians, one, because it wasn't interesting because they're not too forthcoming with their information. And of course, it was a Cold War going on at the time. And, uh, but we did get a cooperation from uh, the French. Uh, I made even a trip to the embassy here in Washington, D.C. and, uh, uh, Commander Sonnier from the French Navy came to help when it came time to get information for the Dunkirk and Strasbourg, which we, which we didn't have much, much material on. Um, in the meantime, uh, Fukui was helping Bob with the uh, Japanese until, I guess, uh, until he really passed away. And and of course, we made contacts through uh, uh, one other Japanese, uh, um, Mackinac, Commander Mackinac, who 
who was a, a vice president of uh, Mitsubishi at the time. And he interviewed both Bob and I and gave us information that we needed on the Japanese, further information that Bob didn't have. And also, he could talk to me about what it was to be a naval architect or a naval constructor designing these ships and operating them. So I had a pretty good idea, so the, the formula off the bottom. Uh, that was help. One day, uh, what an interview that I had with Nikido in New York. What had happened was, Gibson Cox had designed a cable ship, and it was, uh, the Japanese couldn't understand how the, the Germans could underbid them. Well, uh, this, Mr. Gibbs had a, a luncheon to, and invited Mackinac and his assistant to the, to the uh, lunch at one board way uh, because of Cox. Now, I was invited to come along by Mr. Gibbs because Mr. Gibbs knew I was working on, on battleships. Uh, he did not want to talk about the cable ship with uh, Commander Mackinac. So what did he do? He uh, set up the meeting and asked questions about the design of the Yamato. And as it turned out, uh, he managed to get through the day without having to talk about the cable ship, thanks to myself and my knowledge of the Yamato and Musashi. But I met him later at the uh, his hotel in, in uh, New York, and I, he said, he told, I apologized for what happened, and he said, Mr. Garcia, this is no problem. I understand it perfectly well. You're a young naval architect. You're just learning the business. <laughs> and I know what, what Mr. Gibbs wanted, and he didn't get. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, going back, finally came the uh, first volume, volume one, which is the United States battleships. Bob Gilman had did a lot of research on that. And I, as well as myself, but of course, Bob has not, did not have the experience in uh, naval architecture, particularly in, in design, uh, the design and uh, the, the feasibility and preliminary design and contract design as I did. Although he uh, later became uh, uh, in charge of the supervisor of shipbuilding for the, the third naval district in New York. He had an opportunity then to learn a little bit more about uh, contracts and so forth. So he had more experience in the actual construction side of things than I did. And he also spent uh, two years in Sewage Bay in the Philippines as a, uh, as a naval constructor. And so he had a little more shipyard experience, although I would later get that experience at the New York Naval Shipyard for nine months in 1964 to 1960, yeah, rather 1963 to 1964. I, um, I then, we got volume one ready uh, in, by 1976, and that was when it was published. Uh, I was very proud of that effort on, on the uh, United States battleships. A lot of, of course, uh, was due to Bob Doolin because of his experience with uh, the U.S. Navy. But uh, I still was working on the designs and for the chapters in uh, the second volume, which was due to happen. Now we had a problem. We have no illustrator. The Naval Institute did find Thomas G. Webb. Mr. Webb is an excellent draftsman. And the fact of the matter is, in talking with people about Tom's ability to, uh, to draw, he is probably con considered one of the finest uh, uh, illustrators that one could ever find. He has terrific uh, ability with uh, uh, mylar, using mylar, and an 8 inch or 6 inch H pencil. It's a pretty hard pencil, but his drawings are almost like, uh, almost like a photograph. 
and uh, and uh, we also we worked with Tom for volume two, and we got volume two ready, published in 1980. But meanwhile, all of this is going on. We're still looking for uh, information to verify what we have or improve it. But also, we now have the job to get the third volume done. That's the third volume. It's my responsibility. And hence, now you can see, as you see the title, originally the book uh, where Dylan and Garsky, the, after volume, starting with volume two uh, and volume three, it became Garsky and Dylan. Only because I was doing all the work on them, and the first volume was his. Uh, so, uh, in the meantime, we've got very much uh, fortunate in having German sources go over our work and in volume three. And I had uh, correspondence with Dr. Hermann Burkhardt, who designed, who was responsible for the design of Bismarck, and also uh, Hans Riedel, who was uh, his assistant, uh, who sent me all the information on the Bismarck that I could ever want to see. Um, and so, struggling through, in 1985, volume three finally saw, saw the uh, light. And so, but we weren't finished yet. I had a, at this, by this time, I had also adopted a daughter, uh, Elizabeth Ann Garski, uh, from Chile. And this was a very important event in my life, in my wife. Uh, so what happened then, uh, we uh, had three books already published, but the information started flowing in. So the first volume that got affected was volume two. Volume two, I've had some more information that I, and I did an update on that in 1989. Uh, meanwhile, the information still kept flowing in on volume two. But more importantly, volume one needed, a re re needed work. It had already been republished a number of times by, uh, by updates, small updates, and from time to time, I think that must have been about seven updates before I decided in 1996 to really do a real good job of, on volume one. At that point, volume one that became Gosky and Doolin. Yeah, Bill, if you could tell us about your then collaboration with um, Dr. Bauer, that'd be great. All right. Well, in 1989, Bob Dylan and I were called upon by Dr. Bauer to participate in a press conference on his discovery at the National Geographic Society. Now, there's an important development in the meantime that was going on. Uh, I have been involved with uh, doing marine forensic analysis very, very uh, subvertly in a sense. But I was I'm still working for Gibson Cox at this point, although I had spent uh, eight years with George Sharp Naval Architects from 1964 to 1972. But also, in, uh, I had been asked to uh, the sub were teaching at King's Point for a year. They needed an able, they needed an able instructor, and I had been already interviewed. They wanted me to come to work for get, uh, King's Point, but I decided to stay in the, in the field of ship design rather than teach naval architecture. But it interested me, so that in 1982, I did spend one year at the uh, at uh, King's Point, Merchant Marine Academy, teaching naval architects and marine engineering, which I found to be a very, very happy of a, uh, way of doing things. And of course, Harry Benford helped me with this in my first time teaching. Meantime, uh, I also was looking into continuing education 
uh, and naval architecture with the Society of Naval Architects and Great Engineers. And by 1994, uh, I had formulated a course in naval architecture and great engineering, or naval architecture, I should say, for, uh, for introductory people who are not uh, naval architects. It was a, sort of a course about what we do as a naval architect. And I, I did that work from uh, 1995 to 19, uh, 2014. Mm. And I enjoyed uh, teaching naval architecture very much. Uh, then, of course, going back to our research, the battleship uh, development took a new twist on research. And that is, I became more interested in marine forensics and how ships sank. And I was kind of involved with the I'm writing a paper in 1993 on the 100th anniversary of the Society of Naval Architects on underwater submersibles, uh, their past, 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 present, and future. And of course, I used the uh, the uh, Bismarck and the Titanic as examples of what could be done uh, with underwater vehicles. And I gave that paper, and of course what happened was it happened to be a light day in uh, New, uh, press day in New York because of the Jewish holidays. And uh, the New York Times published a, an article on the, on the work that we were going to do, present that day, September 17, 19, uh, 93, on uh, underwater submersibles. But the real interest, as it turned out for the media, was not the submersibles, it was the Titanic. And of course, we had to have a press conference, and I was interviewed by Dan Rather and, and Tom Brokaw, along with the BBC and, and others. And, and every one of the co authors got involved in the interviews as well, including Bob Doolin and a friend of mine, uh, D.K. Brown. And D.K. Brown was a very, very important contact because he was uh, interested in the marine uh, uh, forensics as well as I was. So uh, now we get involved uh, in a new profession of naval architecture, which in a sense, uh, was formulated when I became chairman of the Marine Forensics Committee of the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers, also the Real Royal Institute of Naval Architects and the Marine, uh, 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 American Society of Naval Engineers and the Marine Technology Society. Uh, that all started to come together especially when I was invited to go to, uh, to be on an expedition to the Titanic in 1996 and 1998 to, do, to uh, find out what caused the Titanic to sink. And so from that point on, the committee did a lot of work on Titanic, but also on Bismarck and uh, several other ships, Lusitania, Andrea Doria, the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald, some names with probably people recognize, but again, the the information the information we saw it is how and why did these ships sink, and why what could have been done to prevent the sinking. Of course, we already knew a lot about Yamato and Masashi, and uh, one of the uh, members of our committee named uh, P. H. Nodule, uh did the. Uh, research on the Yamato. He actually went on a dive to the Yamato wreck and uh, gave me some information on, on Yamato, which I later use, will be using in revision of volume three. Uh, in the meantime, unfortunately, I had a nice uh, friendship with B.J. Chodgley. Uh, he was a me member of Armored Titanic Incorporated. And we had a friendship that, that ended tragically in, in uh, 2023 
when he was also on that submersible Titan. And I, I'm very sad to say that to lose such a, a valuable uh, person uh, and friend as I had for pH. But he helped me along with the formulation of marine forensics. And that forensics uh, turned out to be very interesting because now I turn to volume two and three. Volume two was originally written, and I never was really happy ever with the two, with the original public, publication and the repeat in 1989. And I started to do, uh, had an opportunity when one of the uh, divine divers on, uh, on the Prince of Wales in 19, uh, in 2007, came to our meeting uh, and told me about what he had intended to do uh, about a dive on the uh, Prince of Wales. And he shared a lot of information with me on that. Uh, and in 2009, I published a, a uh, paper in, with the, in jointly with the uh, Royal Institute of Naval Architects and the uh, Institute of Marine Engineers on the loss of Prince of Wales in London. And of course that helped along with the fact that uh, now we had uh, information available on what was going on, what happened to Prince of Wales. In 2008, I had a chance to meet the last surviving officer of Prince of Wales uh, and a wild, uh, uh, wildish of the Royal Navy. We had already been corresponding previously on volume two, um, and along with uh, uh, Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Henry Leach, uh, they provided me some really valuable information, particularly photographs of damage uh, in the battle with the Bismarck. Uh, so, and uh, now, I had the opportunity to first hand interview Admiral Wilders in 2008, and he gave me uh, a gift, which is a, a piece of a shell from the Bismarck, and which I have in my possession, which is very valuable because it's, uh, I'm sure there are other pieces available from other people. Who Not too many, maybe. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I also got some first-hand information on how it was to be involved in the battle with Bismarck and as well as the uh, the loss of Prince of Wales. I want to say one thing about Admiral Wilders. Admiral Wilders was a, uh, was almost 94 years old when I met him in 19, in 2008, face to face. We had corresponded for something like 20 years. Um, he uh, was a little bit upset when we finally found out what really happened in the port shaft alley. And uh, my friend, Dr. Buxton, who I should mention, had already been helping me with this research on, French, on, on British battleships, actually going to the uh, archives and getting the information that I needed for writing the, the volume two originally, and I also, he came to the United States, and we had a chance to meet him at Race the Base in 1967. So, in other words, Ian became a lifelong friend, as did Bob Dylan. Uh, and, but now Bob Dylan uh, was not uh, as active now in, in battleship development, because he had a, he had a, a job that demanded really a lot of attention. And <clears throat> although I gave, he gave me some advice, particularly in the Titanic expedition in 1996, when they kind of released the so-called, quote, big beast. The big beast could come to the surface because the ship they're using was not sufficient to do the job. And they called me and Bob late in the evening in uh, August of 1996, on what they should do about the, uh, getting the thing to the surface because there was a hurricane or, 
approaching the, the site of where the, the babies were being hauled off from the seabed. I had already out to, uh, on the, the expedition, providing them information on on the uh, uh, location where this big beast was and how much it weighed as well as getting samples of steel from the Titanic to be analyzed. As part of my my responsibility as chairman of the Marine Forensic Committee. Um, now we uh, we had a lot of information start flowing in Marine Forensic wise from this committee. There was then a call panel SD seven ship design uh, uh, committee of the Society of Naval Architects, but also of course we had a lot of foreign involvement, particularly with D K Brown from the United Kingdom and uh, Ian Botson. And of course, I made contact with uh, one of the authors of a book on French battleships um, uh, about information on, on the Richelieu and the Battle of the Car. She had with the, the free French and English. Uh, all of this information was being catalyzed Put in a, in a revision. However, we were told in 2006 that the Naval Institute was no longer interested in publishing volume two or republishing it. What year is this? 19, 2006. Oh, well, yeah. That was a difficult year at the Naval Institute. And uh, they turned back the copyright to Bob Dylan and myself. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, I started, just for the record, I started in January 2007 because the top three people in 2006 all left by the end of the year. So uh, I'm not responsible. <laughs> just for the record. In the meantime, I also met James Cameron uh, at a, a presentation because he went to the expedition to the Bismarck in 2002. And he gave a presentation to the Smithsonian Institute, or the Smithsonian Associates, mm -hmm. in December of uh, 2003. And I was in the audience, because I was curious as to what he had to say, because I had done the same thing for Dr. Ballard. Now, uh, on the question and answer situation came up, I pointed out to Jim Cameron that uh, about uh, Seaman Joseph Stotts, who had been introduced to me from Barrett Van Ronheim Rickberg, who happened to be one of the more important uh, uh, developments that I had not previously mentioned here. But I had helped Barrett when he published this book in 1980. I met him in Annapolis at the, uh, uh, at the help of the Naval Institute. Um, I, I did not help him in his original book, uh, The Battles of Bismarck, The Survivor's Story, but I had read his book, and then I told him that he needed to make revisions because there were some things that he missed and some things that were, that he, that were wrong. And the Barrett very nicely said, okay. Well, now it comes about with 1989 and uh, the discovery of the Bismarck. And then the National Geographic uh, got us involved, uh, Bob and I involved in that and all the work with Ballard at that point. So we uh, uh, also kind of had contact with uh, Barrett and Rickford, who had been contacted by, by, with, by, by Ballard. And uh, he introduced me to Joseph Stotts. And Mr. Stotts and I had a conference, had a, a conference, not a, a letter writing uh, effort from 1989 to 1999 when he passed away. But on the meantime, he provided a lot of information to me on survivor testimony. And also, he had, was in Damage Control Central, which happened to be. Very interesting because that gave me some information on how the ship sank and why. Uh, so Mrs. Stott was 
Also, we helped him with a publishing a book he did on the Battleship Bismarck in, uh, I think it was probably 1996, uh, 98 time frame. Uh, however, now we have a lot more information uh, available. Mr. Stotts also had contacted some of the other survivors. Bob Doolin and I made a trip to Germany and met one of the, uh, the uh, contacts that we had done who had actually uh, had taken our book, translated into German, and circulated around amongst people that he knew that should help review what we had. And so, in other words, that, that would help in the revision of volume three uh, in uh, 1991. But clearly, Bismarck is getting out ahead of every. Yes. Is taking a, a lead there. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, in all, in all in fairness to everybody in the, that reads volume three, research on Bismarck started in 1959, okay. and it still continues even to today. Yeah. Um, but now we had uh, James Cameron, and he said, of course. At that time, there was a lot of uh, information going on about the Titanic, particularly his movie, Titanic. So in 2006, I finally visited Mr. Cameron along with Joe Billy Ernst and uh, another member, Ken Smith of our uh, panel, SD7, which was a panel then. Uh, Mr. Cameron spent the whole day with us. Uh, going over the Bismarck videos he took of the wreck. And as it turned out, he also had sketches out on the table in his home, uh, or it's actually office. <laughs> it was a whole house full of, uh, yeah, that he used. And had all these photography equipment. And he showed us some of the sketches that he did very interesting sketches which appear in volume in the Bismarck Design and Operational History of Bismarck, and published in 1989 by the Naval History Press and Seaforth Publishing. Uh, then uh, I asked uh, uh, Brother Cameron if he was interested in writing a book on, on the Bismarck. Uh, that came a little bit later after that visit, but it was a, a very interesting to me to see that he was very, very interested in the Bismarck because he had made sketches on of the damage that took place that he saw from his expedition in 2002. In 2008, a very memorable year, uh, that year I published a paper with a survivor of the Andrea Doria for Ed Simpson on the loss of, 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 uh, of, the, of the Andrea Doria. And what we found out was that Captain Calamai, who happened to be the captain of the Italia or the Exclatorio, uh, was vilified for the things that he did on the, in the boy in the uh, collision with the Andrea Doria, or the, or the, the Sacco. And so that paper was published, and then, of course, that was a very important, one of the important papers published by the, by the Society of Architects. But it had a lot of bearing on, in fact, of my development of marine forensic science. In 2007, I'd already been given an award by the University of Michigan, the Rosenblatt Award, for work I had done in naval architecture. Uh, so, 2008 also was a chance when Jim Cameron came to, to Washington, D.C. to make a presentation on the loss of Bismarck with Bob Dylan, Kent Smith, and myself. Uh, very important uh, paper because at that point in time, this paper was well received, and of course, uh, uh, Jim Cameron was made an honorary member of the Society of the American Society of Naval Engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, I kept thinking about volume three as I saw the, all the information that Cameron had done. 
and I started formulating uh, something. So in 2014, I contacted Mr. Cameron because I had been uh, kept in contact with him because he became a member of the Marine Forensics Committee. Now we're a committee as of 2011, and Mr. Cameron is a is a is a, is a member of the committee along with some of Ph. Nardole and a few other people that actually did a lot of work on uh, on, uh, on diving. Uh, and add to that Kevin Denley, who was a part of the 2007 expedition to the Prince of Wales. And Kevin Denley kept push, pushing me, saying, Bill, you've got to republish volume two. And I said, I'd like to do that. Uh, and, but in the meantime, uh, Jim Cameron uh, was asked if he wanted to participate in the Battleship Bismarck book. And he said, you know, Bill, he said, I'm, that's my second favorite ship. Of course, you know, everybody knows he's a Titanic man. Right. Uh, well, he might be the Titanic man, but I also know him as a Titanic man as well. <laughs> Uh, for my own research. But, yeah, you published a big book. You published a big book on uh, superliners. I, I saw that with the Society, right? Uh, wait, but just as a sidebar, I don't want to get you off your yeah. subject, but I do I do know that you've published you know, on ocean liners as well. Yeah, yeah we did a, a book on um, ocean liners uh, after work on them, like on the uh, Olympic mm -hmm. and the Leviathan, the x bottle which, incidentally, modeling has a particular meaning to me because my grandfather was on the ship oh. going to Germany in uh, 1914, and he picked the time to leave New York in uh, 14 July, arriving in, in uh, uh, was it, uh, Hamburg on the 27th of July. That was on the World War I, which began in 19 in August of 1914, right, right. and he was trapped and had to get himself out of Germany because otherwise he could be trapped into the German army, yeah. being a German national right. by birth. And of course, my father-in-law, Andrew Vince, was, uh, came to the United States on the Leviathan, the ex line in 1928. And that's important because Mr. Uh, Professor Vince was a uh, taught uh, uh, marine engineering at CCMY in New York, and uh, it was special uh, on that because uh, firms like General Electric and uh, others sent people to that course to have have him uh, have him uh, go through his lectures. But it turns out he also spoke fluent German, which I didn't. And of course, bearing his daughter, uh, Loretta, uh, provided me the opportunity that he could help me with the translations, which he did, was very, very, uh, very happy to do. And he even uh, at one point, he, uh, somebody in Germany sent me a, a print of the uh, Battleship Age. And uh, he said to me, though, there's got to be a better, uh, better uh, drawing of that ship than the, what you see here. So that put me on a research mode to get find out what I could get on Battleship 8, that's 1964. Uh, and of course, uh, I did find the information on Battleship 8, and that's published in the original volume three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks to the help of my father, Paul, yeah. who was very instrumental in that, in that endeavor. However, now, Bill Yearns, going back to Bill Yearns, he had a lot of information, and he was contacted by James Cameron to go over some of the material that uh, Cameron had found in uh, in the 2002 for his own special on on the loss of Bismarck, which was a documentary done by um, I guess National Geographic, um, and so. All of this material starts funneling in now to a new book on Bismarck, which Cameron is very happy to co collaborate with. He also provided a chapter 
on on the diving on the, on the, on the Bismarck. Of course, we also learned some new information because we now have uh, using marine forensic technique, we can we can pinpoint some of the damage and understand how that damage occurred, and particularly the HMS Hood uh, was involved in the loss of uh, uh, loss by Bismarck, and we did a marine forensic analysis on HMS Hood in that book, the first cut at it. Uh, Research is going on where we hope to do a, a future paper on the loss of HMS as a marine forensic investigation for the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. However, that's still unknown whether or not they're leaving it except the paper. But the point being is the techniques that are involved in how we did the analysis is important for future investigations. Uh, now, uh, the book took uh, about five years to get ready. It's a very, very involved book. Uh, it has uh, a very thorough marine investigation, marine forensic analysis of the wreck, um, which uh, is most interesting because uh, all previous work on the on the Bismarck. Uh, is been changed a lot by that book. Um, there are some important points to point out. Was the uh, the loss of of the Bismarck itself? Uh, we divided the uh, the uh, battle, the final battle, into four segments because it was too hard to uh, to do it all in one one chapter. And um, they uh, uh, made a suggestion by uh, the, uh, the, part, or the the Naval Institute to buy it up that way, which, as it turns out, we also I have done research at, at the uh, at Kew in the United Kingdom, the, the National Archives, uh, on the tracks of each of the ships, which Bill Yards was able to. Uh, recreate in that, in that book, along with photographs of the wreck by, by Mr. Cameron. I'm very happy to say that Mr. Cameron was a very, very helpful individual. He, uh, at times, a little hard to work with, but he's a uh, he's a definitely uh, a person that looks at details, and he's a, a Perfectionist, absolutely. Dr. Mr. Cameron is a perfectionist. I had already been married to a wife that was a perfectionist. So I knew exactly how to work with Mr. Cameron. Uh, and when he said that you'll do it my way or no way at all, uh, I understood. So I had to, if I, if it was, if he was wrong, I had to find good, solid evidence that he was wrong. So that put me to my research abilities, which uh, Bob Dumas told me I was very good at. Now, going back over that whole situation, now we have Bob Dumas involved, Jim Cameron, myself, and Billy Aarons. Now, Billy Aarons is also a perfectionist. And I, although we have done the uh, the uh, the uh, figures and illustrations somewhat, um, he definitely helped. Uh, he and I had a lot of discussions, some heated over exactly how things were said uh, about the damage that took place on Bismarck. And of course, Cameron is involved as, as well. So putting all this together. Uh, it, it was a very challenging episode in my life. But unfortunately, uh, that book, I saw the, uh, some strange uh, occurrences in Bob Dylan's life. 
Bob Dylan, and I have been friends for 60 years. And uh, I used to see that somehow, and his wife, Joan, was concerned too. Uh, he had no longer had the interest that he had when he started out with a battleship book in 1960, in 1962, uh, uh, or 61. And uh, unfortunately, the situation progressed to the point that he passed away in September of 2022. A very sad day for me and and uh, certainly for his wife, Joan. Um, but the other thing was that the, uh, the book uh, was not selling as well as we had hoped for because it's a very big book. It's a laptop book, it's not a, it's a, but it's an encyclopedia of the Bismarck. Now, uh, we have entered the Naval Institute in 19, in 2023. I got a call from Mr. Russell saying, well, you would be interested in doing volume two over again, or updating it. I, he said, we want to republish it. I said, well, you, you come at the right time. I said, I'm very much interested. Unfortunately, Bob Dylan isn't around, so I have to do this myself. But I said, I've already started revising volume two back in 2015. At that point in time, we had a meeting with uh, Steve McLaughlin. Steve uh, has written books for the Naval Institute and Seaforth Publishing on Russian battleships and Russian cruisers. Uh, and uh, he agreed to work with us on revising the chapters on the Soviet Union. Uh, there are Originally, Bob and I had two chapters on the, in volume two, and now we had to expand it to three because of the more information became available during the, the period of when the Cold War ended, or more cooperation with the Russians. In fact, uh, my cousin Brian, very dear cousin, he was like my like a brother, went to the uh, to Leningrad, and he went to the Naval Museum in. Leningrad to get pictures of the of the Russian battleships that he so used, but unfortunately they directed to a, a large cruiser design. But nonetheless, my brain took the pictures, thinking that he had done the, the job for me. Uh, but as it turned out, we couldn't use that information in, in uh, the new volume two. And I say new because it, it is going to be new. It is a uh, a much more detailed analysis of the ship. Meanwhile, the um, information was uh, from uh, Kevin Denley, the diver who, was, uh, who went through the, to the Prince of Wales wreck. And along with some compatriots, started to, he sort of urged us more urgently to get this book republished. And that phone call from the Naval Institute in, in 2023 hit a that tender spot with me, and I said, by all means, we, we, we're going to do it. And of course, a lot more inf new information is available on volume two than had been available to us previously. In the meantime, they also said, what about volume three? I said, well, volume three has more, <laughs> new, more new information also. They've discovered the wrecks of the Charnos, the wrecks of the uh, Yamato and the Musashi, among others. And of course, the, uh, that changes some of the, uh, the material that we wrote originally because we had no idea just how badly damaged some of those ships were, although we knew that they were pretty serious problems, when the, particularly when the Musashi sank. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the difference of two hours and seven hours of love with tax does a lot to a ship, uh, damage-wise. Uh, and also the loss of life was pretty tremendous, very, very bad. So you were comparing, you're comparing uh, the amount of time spent on the attack on Yamato and, and Musashi. Yeah, 
Right. The difference of seven. The advantage was severe and similar in both cases, but. But more on one side on Yamato than uh, on Musashi. Right. And of course, um, an interview I had with the Rear Admiral Holsworth when he was supervisor at the uh, uh, Naval, you know, Naval Shipyard. Uh, I had two interviews with him, and he told me that he had spent time going with the uh, aviators uh, how, how to sink these ships. Told him that they you know, made a mistake when you did the massage by coming in on both sides. When you go and attack the Yamato, you do it from one side and one side only. Well, they did a did a pretty good job. They didn't miss maybe a couple of hits on the on the opposite side, but uh, yeah. the Yamato was dispensed with pretty really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Bill, then. Um so we have the Bismarck book, and now and we have the we have revisions, but these books have been reacquired <laughs> by the Naval Institute, right? Yeah. You were work yeah, you were working the revisions, and 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 Jack reached out to you, and then uh, we discovered that the rights had been reverted in 2006 or thereabouts, and now so then we uh, Naval Institute published the Bismarck book. And then, and now you're working on these two volumes, and they've been reacquired. Yes, and I might want to say volume two for the addition of uh, of Stephen McLaughlin and his expertise on the Soviet uh, makes a big difference because the Soviet chapters now are more authoritative than they were before. And then, in fact, we did more research on the Dutch, and we have a better idea of what uh, the uh, Dutch and their architects had done. And uh, back we were able to find a, a photograph of what the ship was it looked like. It's now in the, in the museum in Holland. Um, the, the other thing that volume two is the biggest difference is going to be the chapter on the Prince, on the King George the Fifth class. Uh, when it was originally written, I had a quite a upbringing in an Irish. German household Irish is important because Irish people don't like British people too much. <laughs> yes, they did in the, in the past. And my mother is Irish. And of course, does she hold a grudge? <laughs> is she holding a grudge against the British? <laughs> yes. The okay. fact of the matter is, my uh, sister Barbara will not go to the United Kingdom because she doesn't like the British. And I was sad for my. My uh, brother-in-law would uh, love very much to do to tour Great Britain. There's some very interesting sites that I know he would have liked to have seen. But uh, on the, beside that, that uh, but the friendship with Ian Buxton is important because it changed my uh, viewpoint on just how on the British a lot more than I did when I started. Uh, I was very critical of the British. Then I realized, with my marine friends, a background and my and my background as a naval architect, that there was certain things that the English could do or the British could do that we couldn't do, mainly because of money. I mean, when you look at the battleship Iowa, for example, it is the most expensive battleship ever built. It, it only has uh, it has triplicate of, of failure. In other words, if one system fails, there's two others that take, can take over. And if the second one fails, there's a third. If the fourth fails, the third fails, rather, there's no alternative. But that in itself tells you that that ship is the most expensive battleship ever built and probably the best battleship ever built. And I'm proud to say that my uncle Jack uh, worked on the on the uh, uh, shaft shafting the uh, installation on on the uh, Missouri and the uh, Iowa, as well as the reconstruction of the battleship Russia U. Yeah, the, which we were just talking about went into Brooklyn Navy Yard in uh, February 1943. Sorry. And uh, so 
your uncle Jackson worked on Richelieu, Missouri, and about Iowa. Iowa, about North Carolina, which was the one. Yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, I don't know how you say that, Jack. Uh, Rick, very interesting. To show you what my uncle Jack, how he was with me, he took an eight millimeter photograph of the North Carolina leading the, the New York Navy on in 1940. Now, a policeman came by and he said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm taking pictures of, of the uh, birds. <laughs> uh, he said, but the policeman didn't press him any further. If it had, he, he might have got in trouble because we weren't supposed to do that. But he, yes, he worked on the North Carolina as well. Mm -hmm. Well, in my invitations to see the uh, uh, the watching is so something that a young person, uh, I was very impressed. I actually saw the shafting of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, carrier, Franklin Roosevelt being machined mm -hmm. on a lathe. Uh, when I went, uh, I saw the launching of that day, although it was wartime, uh, I was a, uh, at eight years old, I was not a, Security threat, <laughs> uh, but I uh, in the business to uh, see the watch of Risky when my mother and father in 1945 uh, we happened to see the uh, the Syrian dry dock, and because that was very impressive. Seems to me the ships being built in New York, of course, North Carolina. Maybe not so much Iowa, but certainly in 1944, Missouri, they had a lot of visitors. Um, you know, Iowa, there's a little bit of pressure there to get her into the fleet. North Carolina, of course, was pre-war, but Missouri was the end of the war, and there was still a lot of people going through, so there were some opportunities to, to visit. The, uh, the, uh, the involvement of President Truman, because his, his daughter christened the, the Missouri, uh, and whether or not the, uh, the uh, Missouri, the ship on which the Japanese surrender. Uh, I thought the thing about that, I always felt that the Enterprise would probably have been the ship that should have been uh, the ship that the Missouri had was on because she had a lot of to do with the destruction of the Japanese Navy. Yeah, yeah, right. So, Bill, so then maybe just to, to recap, then um, you're working. Uh, you're still working, you're working on to revise the second and third volumes, and you've got new, um, you were talking earlier about Prince of Wales, um, some of the issues, you don't have to give it all away, but um, it's good, that's that's moving along. Um, but maybe just as a, you just mentioned, a nice compliment to the Iowas. Um, so without any selection criteria involved, I mean, you choose the selection criteria, What's your favorite battleship? The Iowa class. All four ships. They're the best ships ever designed. And they are certainly, uh, people will argue, well, Yamato has bigger guns. Well, that's so, but she only did 27 knots. However, in an interview with Captain Sequence of the Iowa, in 1991, he told me what I needed, finally needed to know, the real shift horsepower and speed of the Iowa. What he said he did was for me, when I got in the interview, he said, I'll tell you, Mr. Kowalski, we read, I read your book. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I saw the imagine where you said that the ship, uh, uh, you can't believe it, do a little more than 33 knots uh, in a light condition. So he said, I went and arranged to have the uh, ship rigged, the uh, Iowa rigged to a point where the uh, ship was a light draft and I was going to give it full power, that is, overload power, overload power, overload power, which means. 240,000 shift horsepower. And what did the ship do? He said, the ship did 
45 knots. But he said he got a call from the, the uh, CPO nest. Hey, the, 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 the dishes are rattling. <laughs> you have to cut this feed. It's pretty darn horrible down here. That's common though, at high speed. And sometimes you get a vibration, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, but uh, those ships did have a vibration problem at uh, high speed at certain, at certain points. Now that brings up a very interesting point at the University of Michigan. In a course on ship vibration, Dr. Armandroy was the lecturer. In a class that day, one day, he talked about the United States. And he said, the United States has battleship engine rooms. Yes, it does. It has the same engine rooms as the USS Iowa. Now you consider that the United States did 38.25 knots on their trials. And when I was, I was told later that what we and Francis Gibbs kept that secret for a long time. William Francis Gibbs and I had a two and a half hours of, of meeting face to face in, the, in my career at Gibbs and Cox. Uh, and I can say that although he had been promised uh, a lot of files from Suzuki and from Pui, unfortunately that didn't happen because when I left to go to MIT, um, that situation was no longer possible because I, I did not return to Gibson College until 1972, after Gibson passed away in 1969. Mm -hmm. uh, when I sum up my career, I can say to this, I am the very happiest person to be a naval architect. I feel really um, uh, honored to be uh, having gone to the University of Michigan and get my degree. Uh, and as Eric and Jack already know, that this is big M is around, go blue. <laughs> uh, but I am very, very fortunate to have had such good instruction over the years at MIT and uh, at Delphi University when I studied advanced mathematics. Uh, I always, I'm more of a scientist as a naval architect and as a practicing designer. And because I'm interested in why things happen and how they should be done. And doing research on, on the Yamato and the Masaji, particularly the Masaji, writing the uh, revised volume three, I, I, I look at the situation. The poor people on that ship, although it was designed to be a very, impregnable vessel, there is no such thing as an unsinkable ship. And even an unsinkable ship, as much as Musaji and Bismarck were concerned, they sank. And I really, I, it really reviles me to some extent when I hear about the Titanic and the Titanic was unsinkable. Unfortunately, Thomas Andrews was a designer and made one mistake. He said the ship was practically unsinkable. But the news media left out the practically. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the situation as I see it. And, and I, all the events in my life that are important, of course, uh, my wife and daughter, who were very supportive in the many years that I was involved with, with uh, writing and research and a lot of writing and so forth, uh, they've been very patient. Maybe sometimes uh, I, my wife would say the book. Well, yeah, the book, it, it, it was uh, a lot of sacrifice on my part. Probably sometimes could have, so could have had a little more time uh, to, to be with my family than I did. But I'm happy to say that what I've created will probably last for generations. Well, I think that's right, Bill. There's a rare person that uh, makes their mark in, in uh, more than one field. So naval architecture, marine engineering, and of course, naval history. So uh, 
thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate the interview and we'll look forward to chatting again before too much longer.